Okay, thank you, Ragnan. Uh, yeah, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, hope everyone's had a good break. So yes, the fifth panel of today will be critical approaches to Blumhouse's Halloween. And the first paper of, of the panel will is titled, Is the Slasher Dead or Alive? Conflict Genre Discourse and a Supposed State of the Subgenre. And it will be presented by Alex Svensson. Alex is an affiliated faculty at Emerson College in their visual and media arts department. His research primarily focus, focuses on horror media, media controversies, promotional culture, found footage, and studies of space and place. Some of his most recent writing can be found in the new book, Jordan Peele's Get Out, Political Horror, edited by Dawn Heatley. And other work can be found in Participations, Journal of Audience and Reception Studies, Transformative Work and Cultures in Media Res, and Brattle Theatre Film Notes blog. Hi, Alex. Hello, Thea. Thank you so much. All right, let me share my screen. Hello, everyone out there in cyberspace. Uh, I, I, I would say good to see you, but I can't. Um, but uh, very much looking forward to this. Uh, so let me get everything going and we will kick this off. Alrighty, it looks like that is shared. Okay, yes, so as Thea said, the title of this paper is, Is the Slasher Dead or Alive? Conflicted Genre Discourse and the Supposed State of the Subgenre. Um, and that question is one that I'll be exploring from a few different angles in today's presentation. Um, and I've been really interested in this question for a little while. And um, indeed, this paper is sort of a sort of an expression of my interest in that question, my sort of puzzlement about that question, um, and my interest overall in the kind of we could say discourse um, that that produces that question or seems to kind of ruminate on that question over and over again um, across not just horror scholarship, but I'm primarily interested in popular press journalism, um, write-ups on various horror blogs and news sites, um, and the sort of audience commentary and questioning about the um, popularity, the current um, 21st century uh, popularity, vitality, and viability of the slasher genre within the mainstream, the kind of conversations that happen not just in the popular press or more um, genre-dedicated web spaces, um, but also across uh, forums like Twitter, Reddit, other forms of social media. Um, and so this presentation will be um, a slice of that research, a sort of cross-section, um, if you will, uh, perhaps a, a particularly bloody one in many ways befitting this, um, this um, presentation and, and overall conference. Um, and so it seems that, as, as the title of this talk suggests, um, there seems to be this question about whether or not the slasher, again, is alive or dead, meaning that it is there underway in the late 2010s, moving into the 2020s, um, start, started or surrounding in part by Blumhouse's Halloween from 2018, uh, directed by David Gordon Green, and, and in many ways uh, revolving around the upcoming uh, sequels to that film, Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends. Um, is there a new cycle of slasher movies that seems to have been initiated? Um, uh, not only a new cycle of slasher movies, um, one that is deeply popular, that is legible as slasher movies, in many ways slashers that perhaps harken back to the first cycle of slasher films of the late 70s and early 1980s. Um, are they legible? Are they hyper-visible? And indeed, are they profitable? Um, and something that I'll talk about a little bit in today's um, talk as well um, is this notion that uh, the, the sort of vital signs of the slasher genre, as it were, um, that status of the genre as alive or dead, um, seems to not just rest on the sheer presence or volume of slasher films, um, or even on a way in which um, slasher films are readily being produced by um, a host of different, um, different film uh, studios and production houses, um, from the most mainstream to the smallest um, indie level um, that you can possibly think of, right? Um, everything from major theatrical releases um, to uh, you know uh, low budge slasher films that 
pop up on streaming services like um, like Amazon, like Shutter, and so on and so forth. Um, instead, this this sense of the vitality of the slasher seems to really rest and, and hinge on uh, popularity and indeed box office success, high box office success, um, as a clear marker of the fact that the genre is very much alive. Um, not only this, um, in terms of its its visibility and its profitability, but there also seems to be a sense that in order for the slasher genre to be currently considered alive um, across a lot of the more popular discourse um, from journalists, from newspapers, from magazines, from online publications, um, that there also needs to be a, what we can call a kind of return or resurgence of the so-called horror icon. I mean, indeed, that, that notion of the icon is one that Michael Myers in Halloween, of course, very much fits into that mold um, of the kind of iconic member of what we can call a sort of rogues gallery of 19, 1970s and 1980s, um, not simply just slashers, but things that may seem sort of slasher adjacent. So we're thinking of Michael, we're thinking of Freddy Krueger, um, Jason Voorhees, Leatherface, um, I would include other characters like Leprechaun, um, Hellraiser, um, Chucky from Child's Play, and so on and so forth, um, as part of that kind of iconography um, of the slasher, but also of the sort of more ubiquitous sense of 80s horror writ large. Um, so one of the inter interesting things about a lot of this discourse, and we can see some of the um, some of the headlines um, here uh, culled from the past several years across the internet um, that we see the comeback of the slasher movie is happening, the slasher revival is happening, they're back, they're personal, they're not dead yet, um, and indeed um, so much of this as we can see from uh, the headlines themselves, from the attached images, so much of this notion of success, of resurgence, of a comeback, um, indeed, these ideas of resurrection, of renaissance, of revival, and rebirth uh, in, in the abstract, I had joked that these all uh, make for really great um, subtitles um, for uh, slasher sequels in many ways. So it, it, kind of, it kind of makes sense that this terminology is being utilized again and again and again. Um, but we can see so much of this hinges on the success um, and the presence of Halloween. So there are a few ways that I want to think about this discourse moving forward in this talk. Um, what specifically these different conversations, um, accolades, predictions, um, indeed um, sort of hopes in many ways by a lot of authors, a genuine sense of hope and excitement that the slasher is back. Um, this talk will consider what some of that means. Um, and um, to begin to do so, um, I want to think first of the idea of discourse and what, what I sort of mean by that and what, I'm, uh, what sort of scholarly work and tradition I'm drawing upon and thinking about that term. Um, and to be brief, um, wondering whether or not the slasher is dead or alive um, re requires a sense of a sort of definition of what the slasher is. Right? Um, and there's something that I find quite fascinating in a lot of the sort of discourse surrounding um, the release of Halloween in 2018 and this pursuit of the question of the sort of status of the slasher um, is that for a lot of authors, there seems to be a sense that the slasher itself, um, as we can define it, is something that um, purely harkens back to this moment in the 1980s that the slasher itself is something that is uh, sort of rife with dead teenagers, blood and guts and so on and so forth. Um, and that there's a particular kind of model um, of the slasher from several decades ago um, of the subgenre um, that the current moment seems to be reflecting on, feeding off of, um, borrowing from in many different ways. Um, and this is interesting to consider here um, because I, I would argue, um, as I'm sure many of us uh, that are in attendance at this conference would also agree with, and uh, many panels that I've seen so far today are very much, have very much been invested in kind of questioning um, more sort of hard and fast definitions of, um, of the slasher genre to consider it as I do, that, that all genre classification 
is complex, is messy, is contingent, um, and it's it's a social and industrial process. Um, to borrow from James Narrowmore's um, influential study on film noir um, from the 1990s, um, he makes this statement about film noir and the, the terminology itself um, that I'd like to borrow and apply to the slasher. Um, and he argues um, that, and, and by way, I would like to argue that the slasher, quote, belongs to the history of ideas as much as to the history of cinema. It has less to do with a group of artifacts, um, so the sort of individual films themselves or these sort of discrete film cycles, um, than with a discourse, a loose evolving system of arguments and readings helping to shape commercial strategies and aesthetic ideologies, right? Helping to shape um, what kind of films get made and what they are, right? W what they're made of, what they look like, what they feel like in many different ways. And so I'm interested then in this overall discourse about the slasher um, and the ways in which the slasher is positioned as something um, that is not only back, but needs to be back perhaps. Um, and in doing so, um, draws upon its late 70s and early 80s forebearers to acquire the sort of power to be as present, as vital, as viable, and as legible as they arguably seem to be, according to various journalists and critics. And so it's to some of that discourse that I'd like to be able to, uh, to turn to here. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read this uh, in full. I find it's quite instructive. Um, this coming from a, a piece by Richard Newby um, in The Hollywood Reporter um, in 2018 upon the release of um, Blumhouse's Halloween Rights right before it came out. Um, and Newby sort of sets the scene as such um, in 2018, sort of sets the stage for this resurgence, this revival, um, and um, places a lot of sort of high hopes in many ways that Halloween can be this film that jump starts this kind of revolution in many ways. And so he argues that, uh, sort of posits that, quote, whether it's a result of audience burnout from the cycle of 80s remakes that defined so much of early 2000s studio horror, or whether supernatural horror is more appealing because it highlights our inability to have control over the world, something that runs parallel to our political climate. Uh, slasher movies have been cast off to the fringe. But while it's been residing there, it's also been evolving, picking up our social changes and becoming, if not prestigious, then at least something that could have real staying power in a few years' time. The slasher movie is reviving right under our noses. But he asks, are audiences invested enough to show up for it? So the slasher movie is reviving right under our noses. Uh, and I, I want to sort of sort of hone in on a few different aspects of what Newby is talking here, uh, talking about here, I should say. Um, overall, I would also indicate that this kind of approach that um, the slasher movie is sort of reviving, is having this sense of a kind of resurgence um, around and due to Halloween is um, this uh, sort of shared, um, you know, a very much shared uh, perspective. Um, and that um, as sort of echoed by uh, the author uh, Jeffrey Bloomer, who writes um, in Slate in 2019, reflecting on Halloween and a few other similar films um, that have come out in that time period. Um, other authors make reference to films like Freaky. A lot of authors around 2018, 2019 talk about Happy Death Day in its sequel, Happy Death Day to You. I'm including in here something that is being discussed a little bit more often this summer, um, and that includes the non-theatrical release of the Fear Street trilogy um, of slasher films uh, on, on Netflix, direct to Netflix. Um, that one thing that, that Bloomer argues um, is that um, this, as he calls it, a sort of curious moment, that this curious moment in slasher history um, feels in some ways, uh, it's not simply just a sort of revival, but he says it feels less like a new golden age um, than a moment of overdue appreciation for a dusty but durable old form amid a horror resurgence that shows no signs of slowing down. Um, may it be long and bloody, 
Purists can sneer all they like, but I'll be in the front row with popcorn, a ghost face mask, and a glow in the dark knife, end quote. So there's a few different interesting things, and I would argue perhaps conflicting things that seem to be happening here, even in just these few examples of the kind of discourse that I'm interested in in this project overall. Newbie's approach in many ways is defined by this idea that um, the resurgence of the slasher in many ways currently with Halloween as the leader of the pack um, offers a kind of corrective to the horror of the early 2000s in many ways. Um, and I'll, I'll speak to that more in a second. Um, that it does so in a way, um, not just as a kind of escapist cinema, but something that can um, very faithfully and very honestly and very bluntly in many ways attack political and social problems. And indeed Halloween 2018 is very much um, applauded, and I, I certainly found it so fascinating and rewarding because of the ways um, that it addressed issues of, of trauma, um, issues of um, cycles of trauma and abuse, um, the ways in which, as Jamie Lee Curtis herself um, has talked about um, in interviews about her character of Laurie Strode and her evolution over the last 40 years, the ways in which the film uh, very much spoke to um, issues of sexual assault, sexual abuse, violence um, that encompasses not just the Me Too movement of the past few years, um, but right um, various um, aspects of um, feminist politics um, over the last several decades, right, um, and that the film itself can speak to that um, in a really productive and powerful way. Um, Newbie sees the sort of revival of the slasher as fitting in with that. Um, that sort of process. Um, in many ways, this is also echoed um, by, by Bloomer, um, that uh, as he writes in the piece for Slate, um, that in, in the past, um, according to him, uh, the great slashers are, quote, rife with social anxieties, wry wit, and subversive ideas that go a lot deeper than have sex and die. Uh, last year's mega hit Halloween made this more explicit than most, carving itself into a struggle between generations of women and a faceless man who's haunted by them, uh, who's haunted them for decades. Um, and goes on to cite other films such as Happy Death Day, Us, and Child's Play, um, the the new remake, um, as films that also seem to um, have supposedly bigger, broader more intensified ideas, more clear politics, um, slightly more subversive. They tap into social anxieties. They are allegorical in some ways. Um, they are simply more than simply just the dead teenager mo movie. Um, indeed, one word that I see pop up again and again and again in a lot of this discourse is that the slasher movie has redeemed itself and that the slasher movie, as of the late 2010s um, and into the 2020s, has become respectable. Um, and that's a term, a term I'm still sort of wrestling with and sort of grappling with in my work. And indeed, it's something that I would be really interested in perhaps chatting about um, in Q&A if we have time. But I think there's something really interesting that this idea that the slasher um, has been revived, resuscitated, and made respectable in many ways. Um, and um, does, this, does this defang the slasher, right? Does this sort of miss a lot of opportunities for the kind of uh, potential sort of luridness um, and a sort of grotesqueries that the slasher is also very much known for. Um, can, can this sense of a kind of respectability um, and the slasher's perhaps less reputable past, can they coexist in some ways? Um, all of this sort of discourse about the slasher is also deeply tied into overall conversations about what a lot of authors um, in the popular press continuously seem to deem a kind of modern horror renaissance and a kind of horror resurgence. Um, and what's sort of fascinating about all of this um, is that this is, for me, quite reminiscent um, of a lot of sort of conversations um, that have sort of occurred about the horror, horror genre um, seemingly decade after decade, right? Um, I think we all know in this panel and at this conference that 
horror movies have always been vital. They've always been present. They've always been financially successful and culturally influential. Um, and yet, again and again, the discourse seems to ignore that history, um, seems to ignore, um, indeed, ignore certain forms of, of course, scholarship on the genre um, to make the claim again and again that horror is, is now back, as if it seemed to have gone somewhere. Um, indeed, as William Proctor points out, um, in, uh, in 2019, over the past year or so, he says, horror cinema has been discursively underpinned uh, by what entertainment critics have described as a new golden age, a renaissance that is demonstrative of an unequivocal cultural, industrial, and attitudinal shift. The second decade of the new millennium is, as many critics have pointed out, a high generic watermark represented by, quote, quality horror, smart horror, high concept horror, elevated horror, horror adjacent, and post-horror, um, terms that, and he quotes the author Nicholas Barker, um, accounts for operate as backhanded compliments, bolstering the notion that the genre is much maligned. Um, and so in many ways, right, uh, I'm not only interested in, in sort of the future of this project in sort of exploring whether or not this notion of the slasher's resurgence or rebirth or respectability sits easily with its perhaps more sordid past, um, but whether or not that sort of claim of the slasher's revival um, very much incorrectly in some ways points to uh, the, the disreputability of the genre writ large and the subgenre itself, right? Um, that only understands the modern slasher, the contemporary slasher, in relation to a very massive complex body of work um, that is reduced to um, perhaps a kind of, um, to sort of draw upon some earlier work um, seen in the panel today, right, draws upon sort of these cultural memories of the moment of, of the video nasties um, and things like this, right, um, of, of reviews uh, from Siskel and Ebert, right, that, um, that very much damn the sort of slasher movie um, and movies that feature dead teenagers and women in peril and so on and so forth. Um, so this is also something that, um, to me, brings to mind uh, what Stephen Hanke ha had written in um, 2010 um, about this sort of rhetoric of crisis that he he he, um, he cites sort of emanating around the status of the horror film, right? Um, especially with its sort of uh, massive amounts of of remakes, of sequels, of reboots, and so on and so forth. Um, this notion that he 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 argues. Um, that we need to, and I would apply this to the rhetoric of the sort of slasher's revival, um, that we need to resist the pull that emanates from the rhetoric of crisis. Uh, um, the tendency to, uh, and I, again, I see this as happening with the rhetoric around the slasher itself and its revival, um, the tendency to equalize differences, pass over generalized value judgments, and to miss what is genuinely unique about individual films, as well as about the total horror film production in the United States. And he's arguing over the first decade of the 21st century. And I would argue that um, we need to pay attention to these things as well um, and try to perhaps uh, sort of sift through and work through this rhetoric of intense sort of celebration and excitement around the notion of the slasher. Um, because in many ways, and this is where I'll begin to wrap up as well, in many ways, what we are seeing with the slasher um, is not simply just um, something that I, I, you know, a lot of critics um, point to this notion that hopefully Halloween is something that jumpstarts a revival um, of a lot of different types of films um, that evolve the genre, that allow the genre to explore various themes, various identities, um, and so on and so forth in various politics. Um, but what I find really fascinating uh, is that I would, I would more so argue um, that the, the, the contemporary slasher itself is more so what we can call a kind of soft reboot um, or taking part in the larger cultural process and cycle of soft reboots, not necessarily a revival um, of the slasher genre that Halloween is taking part in, um, but rather Halloween is more so conforming to an already existing and quite viable and legible process within Hollywood um, that is connected to this resurgence of the slasher in popularity and profitability, but is not the only explanation, right? Um, and so as Constantine Verovis defined that rebooting is a process 
of restarting, remaking, or recommercializing a film property or franchise by denying or nullifying earlier iterations in order to begin again without requiring any knowledge of those previous works. Um, and James Flurry expands upon this by arguing that the soft reboot can be understood as a kind of corrective, one that resets some of their respective franchises' narrative, um, and overall what we can perhaps call a, a, a sort of process of legacy rebooting, especially with um, Halloween and its 40-year franchise in mind, um, that's linked to our nostalgia for the 1980s, which in many ways this sort of discourse, that nostalgia emanates from that discourse, um, and arguably, um, or, or, although we can, you know, we sort of have to sort of take it with a grain of salt, um, the kind of financial security of established horror franchises um, and, and icons and brands and so on and so forth. I um, mean, we see this happening and in many ways being planned to happen again and again, not just with movies that are slashers or slasher adjacent, um, but of course, as of this summer, indeed, as of a few weeks ago, announcements for um, sort of what we can call sort of soft, soft reboots, revivals or, rad, or reimaginings of The Exorcist and of Hellraiser, um, many of which um, are, of course, linked to, uh, to Universal, um, and specifically, um, the deal involved with Universal and Peacock is one that uh, is really fascinating to sort of keep in mind, right? Uh, one thing that um, Flurry talks about in his work on reboots and reimaginings um, is the way in which um, studios nowadays are not necessarily so much dealing with genres as they are with brands. Um, in many ways, not simply just for theatrical exhibition and success, um, but to sort of draw upon, as is this oft-used term now um, um, of IP that we see regularly in the discourse, um, to build film libraries. Um, and um, so one thing that I want to sort of watch out for um, with Halloween and the subsequent releases of Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends is that these films are also um, very much primed for deals with Universal and Peacock um, to appear on their streaming service um, sort of first look um, in 2022, right? Um, and so I'll, I'll end here, um, but I think this is overall sort of a way in which I'd like us to uh, sort of think about uh, the, the various ways in which the slasher is present and the sort of, sort of rationale in many ways behind that. Um, and I see that in many ways not so much as indication that the slasher itself is revived and we're set to have a new and really remarkably unique cycle, um, but rather that it's, it's already sort of taking part in and sort of contributing to um, a uh, already pre-existing sort of mode of production and marketing uh, within Hollywood and mainstream filmmaking at large. So um, I will end there um, and thank you so much. Fantastic, thank you, Alex. That was very interesting. Okay, so the second paper of the evening is titled John Carpenter has some harsh words for Rob Zombie. Fan nostalgia, the Halloween franchise and the authenticity of the horror auteur. And it is presented by Dr. Mark Richard Adams. And Mark teaches at the New College in Swindon. Take it away, Mark. Um, yep, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, it was a really good one to, to follow, actually, because I think... Uh, I hope you're not too fed up with seeing uh, little images from different um, websites because there's there's going to be more. So I'm just going to screen share. I also like to get out uh, early on and just share. I am autistic and I might occasionally start rambling or go off sub subject. I do apologize if that happens. I will attempt to to avoid. And I'm trying to screen share the right. Uh, Right, here we go. Let's see. Let's see if this works. All right. Can we see this? Okay, excellent. We can see me. I just couldn't see me. <laughs> it was just me. Okay, so yeah, let's have a let's make a start. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, a bit about nostalgia and marketing for the 2018 Halloween film. Um, this is very much a work in progress paper, which is probably not what my editor wants to hear. Sorry, Wickham. Um, <laughs> what I'm here to kind of present to you, I say, is an ongoing piece. I'm looking at how Blumhouse Pictures, new Halloween film, 
markets itself to the franchise's uh, fan base through using nostalgia for the past to construct an uh, idea of a more authentic future. Um, just because I tend to go rambling over a bit, I've had to cut this back a little bit. So some of these elements in the title will be a bit uh, glossed over, I'm afraid, but hopefully we, we'll get the overall the overall idea. Um, to get there, I'm going to shamelessly discuss my own Halloween fandom and my engagement with online internet fan message boards in the late 90s uh, and how fans have engaged with the franchise because I'm really interested in the context that sort of come from how fans look at a, uh, a franchise this year, like this um, and with the sort of start look at the convoluted history of the Halloween franchise um, and how the different films relate to each other and we've got uh, all of them here in all their glory um <laughs> and trust me this is going to be more complicated than it might sound uh, i'm going to touch then on themes of authorship and authenticity here as well but as i said i don't quite have the time to go into too much detail um and so then i'm going to finally sort of examine how blumhouse has utilized fan nostalgia in the desire to sort of position the 2018 sequel as an authentic product and spiritual successor to the original 1978 film which halloween is which so here we have three films <laughs> called halloween one is a remake of one one is a sequel to the other um Understanding the somewhat convoluted interrelations of these numerous sequels to each other, I think is important because the fans themselves place importance um, on this sort of legacy. Um, and because nostalgia, I think, necessitates an understanding of what came to before and how it's relating to what came before. Um, and with the exception of Halloween 3, which existed as a standalone film intended to begin a series of annual Halloween themed movies until its relative lack of success saw Michael Myers resurrected. The series actually ha followed a, a sort of single continuity for almost 20 years. Um, Halloween H2O, however, provided, I suppose you might call it a, a soft reboot, in that is ignoring some elements from the sequels with the, which did not feature a star, Jamie Lee Curtis, whilst retaining others. And this was sort of continue into the, the following sequel. Resurrection. Uh, the box office disappointment of the latter eventually led to the successful duo of remakes from Rob Zombie, although a planned third entry failed to materialize. And then Blumhouse Pictures, hugely successful in producing low budget commercial horror films, stepped in to produce the 2018 sequel. This time, as I say, a direct sequel to the original film, ignoring the rest of the series entries. If you're still confused, luckily we can turn to everyone's favourite reference source, Wikipedia. Here we go. A handy timeline which gives us a visual guide to the series. <laughs> Trust me, this is, in fact, accurate. Um, and as you can see from this, the series thus has three second chapters called Halloween 2, Halloween 2 and Halloween. Three third chapters called Halloween 4, Halloween H2O and Halloween Kills. And it has three fourth chapters called Halloween 5, Halloween Resurrection, and the upcoming Halloween Ends. It's fine, it's fine if we feel confused, but imagine how the fans feel, okay? Um, at the risk of showing then too much enthusiasm and not enough academic rationality, I will say that in my late teens, I got very passionately into the Halloween franchise, and um, I think my autistic brain, I didn't know about it then, but now I look back, the autistic brain went hyper-focused. This is what, this is where you live now, the Halloween communities. Um, and this is where I encountered fandom for the first time, really, um, between the release of H2O in 98 and Resurrection in 2002. Um, and at this time, the series time, I'd only split for the first time. So Halloween 3 aside, fans had considered the series a single ongoing narrative. So Halloween H2O is the first main disruption to this, albeit in relatively minor ways. The films did actually show signs of having initially been written as a continuation, um, most notably through Laurie Strode having been said to have faked her death, which has first been reported in Halloween 4. Um, the fan communities I encountered, often based around the old GeoCities message boards or the official Halloween website, featured a kind of prominent 
fan fiction writing element, often in the form of fans' own sequel scripts. And both these scripts and fan discussion at the time seemed especially centred around the idea of connecting Halloween H2O to the preceding films and explaining away specific plot inconsistencies. So fans often engage in this kind of world building through fan fiction and sort of online discussion and pick up on, expand on details that the official producers, you know, perceive to overlook. And I'm just going to quickly grab a quote from Sir Gwen Jones um, on creating fictional worlds. She says, the meticulous gathering and mapping of textual, metatextual data is charismatic activity of fans. This information is collected, cross-referenced, and often further elaborated on through reference to and investigations into related external texts and discourses. So understanding and cataloging the textual world is important to fandom. Um, so perceived diversions or alterations are kind of looked upon negatively as a, as a threat to the fans' kind of constructed fictional world. As, so Henry Jenkins said that while fans will recognise the story's constructiveness, they sort of treat it as if the narrative world were a real place, being inhabited and explored, and the characters maintain a life beyond what's on screen. Um, so Halloween fan fiction from the late 90s will often strive to explain uh, through various hoops jumping uh, why Laurie Strode abandoned her daughter Jamie Lloyd played by Daniel Harris in Halloween 4 and 5, yet lived with her son, John Tate, in, in Halloween H2O. However, by the time of Halloween Resurrection, and I think supported by some comic paratext by writer Stephen Hutchinson, which emphasised the new split timeline in the series, fandom began to become more accepting of this sort of division in the narrative of the series. Uh, and this is just an example of a comment I found which I thought just sort of sums that up. So it can be easily reworked with H2O and Resurrection, uh, a part of four, five, and six. We got a backstory about Loomis and H2O from some cop who heard secondhand rumours. Lori wasn't in Haddonfield in years, so she probably didn't know what Jamie was sent there. I mean, it's her daughter, but whatever. Um, as I say, it, it's a common kind of desire to try and unify, unify a sort of narrative world. With all this kind of divide, um, there was no longer a cohesive or definitive narrative. And if H. Show decanonized uh, sorry, four, fifth, and sixth films, itself in in itself was erased first with the remake and then with Blumhouse's sequel. Um, and that's kind of what I want to look at now. Is that when Blumhouse required the rights to produce a sequel, it's easy to see the difficulty in their approach. Um, what do they do? Uh, should they continue on from Zombies remake with the third entry? Or do they do a sequel to Resurrection? Or perhaps The Curse of Michael Myers, pick up where that left off? Or attempt, as this uh, fan has suggested, to unite the whole lot? Another reboot, barely a decade after the last, might have been something more difficult to, to market, not only to a mass audience, but especially to the discerning and ever critical fan. So that decision to sort of disregard all but the first film and create a direct sequel, which even removes the really central idea for a lot of the films of Lloyd Strode as Michael Myers' secret sister, established in 82's Halloween 2, is a very logical decision. And it allows them to bring together the fan's sort of desire for authenticity, because how can you be authentic with these various strands where you go back to that first film because no one's denying the authenticity of that first film and it can also appeal to the nostalgia for that first film so that's kind of um what they did with fandom and they unable to reconcile a cohesive franchise narrative a return to the authorship of john carpenter and signifiers relating to that original film the undisputed original work um was an ideal way to court fan engagement and support for the new film. Of course, I would be remiss to say that they also missed the other obvious solution to their new Halloween film, but luckily the fans once more come through with us and show us what might have been. A missed opportunity, I feel. Okay, so <laughs> moving on. Yeah, we all wanna watch that film now, I'm sure. Um, 
Yeah, actually, so Blumhouse has decided to make a sequel, and actually, by the account of the director, David Gordon Green, they did at least attempt to follow up from all the previous sequels, or though this included uh, whether this it would whether this included a reconciliation of parts four to six, H2 and Resurrection remains unclear. Um, but it says it was, they wrote over 80 drafts, they say, at some point, which I estimate is about half the number of fan scripts that attempted the same thing. Um, I digress. I'm, we've just heard about sort of the idea of soft re rebooting, sort of legacy rebooting. Um, so I'm not going to sort of go over that again, especially because I'm really pushing for time. But yeah, they've sort of gone for this kind of reboot of the whole of the whole series whole um legacy from that first film and as we see from the um interview here this decision to create a new direct sequel to 1978's halloween was seen as an ideal opportunity to engage with and make use of the icons from the original film um most notably jimmy lee curtis as the star nick castles the original michael myers who had not played the role since and of course john carpenter as the sort of alter figure um i do have a little bit to talk about with him but i'm a little concerned for times but i will just say that authorship um is a concept that obviously really we can easily define it, it doesn't it's not really a sort of definitive role um that an author plays within film because uh franchises i mean very few horror franchises maintain the same creative teams or even the same owners across the sequels so there's a lot of different Voices involved, filmmaking is a collaborative collaborative work. Um, a film text can be seen as having many authors, but at the same time, authorship of a text is placed on one specific individual, the John Carpenter or the Rob Zombie, and they become, for, especially for fans, that authority, that figure who represents what should be done with the film series. So go look at this uh, Laurie Strode promo now um, and start thinking about nostalgia. Okay, so we're going to go for authenticity and we're going to build that through this sense of looking at nostalgia for that kind of authentic past. Um, it comes in a number of different ways. Um, and first, I want to look at the sort of aesthetic aspect, which I think is clearly seen in, in this initial promo image. Halloween is, after all, a holiday. Um, and in America, especially, a very mainstream one. Uh, the image firstly works to offer up kind of signifiers of a traditional Halloween. So you've got the kind of the kind of Halloween you remember from childhood. So you've got the little glowing pumpkin down the corner there, with the traditional carved face. I think there's a strong emphasis on kind of wooden architecture, fallen leaves that uh, have been blown by a breeze, you know, of the cold nights and the autumn months. And there's the kind of blue light because this sense of the growing encroaching darkness contrasted with small points of warm light from the torches. So autumn and Halloween, it's a time of longer nights, crisp colourful leaves growing colder. The scenery of the porch as well directly invokes the sight of trick-or-treating, the key feature children associate with Halloween nights. So this image instantly puts across a, a time, a place, a kind of emotion, an atmosphere, and, that, and that's going to go to all viewers. Um, instantly, I think that element, but for Halloween fans specifically and fans of the whole genre, slasher genre, this promo picture has even more to offer. Yeah. So, as you can see, Jamie Lee Curtis is directly referencing her look from the original Halloween. Um, I mean, this picture I've used here is not an uncommon one um, to see, and the promo image is directly referencing the pose and expression sorry <clears throat> the pose and expression of the uh, sort of original image in various ways the costume has been recreated and aside from the age of Curtis herself the rest of the scene could easily be set in the period of the original movie um I do suspect Michael Myers here might be a, some kind of photoshop uh don't quote me on that but the look of the character is essentially a complete recreation of the original film, unaged. And so for Halloween fans, the whole image is an exercise in nostalgia that's going to directly connect this new film with the original film. Um, and whilst at this point audiences did not know necessarily how the film would relate to the other sequels, um, it's interesting to note her hair in this sort of 
matches more her look in Halloween H2O, whereas the fight, the eventual film would uh, sort of directly match her look in um, the original films as well. Um, in the in sorry, in Halloween 2018, her hair would be more aligned with uh, how it would look. So you've got uh, a lot of references to the past, but because you've clearly got the older Jamie Lee Curtis and the more mature, it's still also saying, no, this is going forward. This is this is both nostalgic for the past, but also looking forward to the future. And I think we find that in some of the other imagery of the film. And this is something else we've heard about today is the look, look of Michael Myers is constructed to appear as an aged version of the original. Um, and so enforcing this element of aesthetic sort of nostalgia, but also acknowledging the time divide, that this is a new product. It is both original and new. Because interestingly, Zombies film, seen on, on the uh, left there, uh, tried to age the mass with damage and cuts and tears, uh, which would be taken to the greater extreme in the sequel, tearing half the mask away, uh, very much removing that face. Whereas with... Um, Michael, his face is almost, it is his face, and it's almost aged naturally, as we noted today. So this draws the connections. This is not a different mask. This is the same character separated by 40 years. Um, so the, the thing I've been looking at when I've been looking at nostalgia a lot was uh, Michael Pickering and Emily Knightley. When they say nostalgia becomes manifest in a wide range of forms with feelings, meanings, values associated it, with it being dependent on specific social and historical contexts. Uh, nostalgia may be deployed as a source of creative renewal or critique of changed conditions within the present. And I, I really liked this quote because I think it kind of says a lot what I'm interested in about the context of the series, the context of where Halloween fans are coming from when they're looking at these images and how it relates to what they've seen before and what other films we've got in the, the series and how, how that context matters. But also this idea of both creative renewal and critique of the change conditions within the present. In the case of um, Blumhouse's Halloween, we sort of have both. It's creating something to renew the franchise. It's building an authenticity and support for the new film. But there's also a sort of bespoke criticism of the changes within the franchise found in the zombie films. And for some fans, this sort of dichotomy between that sort of Blumhouse authentic sequel and, to quote Kim Newman, the white trash remake, uh, was a major factor in their sort of engagement with the new movie. Um, which sort of brings me to the headline that, uh, sort of in my title, the, the quote I used. John Carpenter has harsh words for Rob Zombie. This was very newsworthy because fans care about that, like, that authenticity. And here we directly have the original authentic creator clashing almost. And, and honestly, if you read the article, it's not as bad in places as they make it sound, they work it out. But that's not the point. The point is that it makes for a good headline. Um, some people putting it in nicer terms than others, as, as we can see from Loudwire. Um, they're not going to pull any punches there. Um, but what I thought was interesting about this comment um, is that he does say, you know, I said, make it your own movie, man. This is yours now. Don't worry. Uh, don't worry about me, Carpenter said to Zombie at one point. Um, he was supportive, he claims. But at the same time, he then criticises it. He says, I thought he took away the mystique of the story by explaining too much about Michael Myers. He's supposed to be a force of nature. He's supposed to be su almost supernatural. And he was too big. So <laughs> he both says how he's supportive for a different take, but he also didn't like that take. So even Carpenter's saying that's that's not authentic. And again, as sort of icon, the creator for fans, his word means a lot. Hence the, uh, the headlining. Uh, I'm just going to think of retrotyping there, which is a, an, an again term uh, used by Pickering and Knightley. It's sort of looking at this form of um, nostalgia as a distinctive manner of remembering, which depends on a purpose, uh, purpose for. Per can't say that purpose is selectiveness of recall that celebrates certain aspects of a past period and discards others that would compromise the celebratory process and undermine its commercial intent. I think that's kind of interesting because they, when they talk about it, they're talking about sort of bread advert. But I actually think when we're looking at the marketing of franchise horror movies, especially something steeped in nostalgia and authenticity of the past, like Blumhouse's 2018 film, it's really important to 
look at. In this case, Blumhouse's film seeks to gloss over everything else that has happened in the franchise, even the sister connection that became so important, and which Carpenter himself has said he dislikes. Um, and distancing itself from any association with the, the less popular installments, decisions they make, um, and instead celebrating the original as the kind of timeless classic. Um, so then Halloween 2018, by moving away from them, it's not just the latest sequel. It's not a new remake. It's the first true definitive sequel. It's using the past and the nostalgic view of it in order to build on that. And, and from what we've seen elsewhere, uh, I kind of think this means, yeah, it makes it a kind of um, metamodern sort of slasher because of, because of that. So I just sort of add that note in. Um, <laughs> I am... I know coming up to this, I am sort of skimming over a lot of bits here. I uh, just wanted to make a, another note how reality can be compromised in seeking out the ideal and nostalgic authenticity. So Michael Myers was played by Nick Castle in the original film, and he has not played the role since. News sites celebrated his return as a sign of authenticity, and even we saw recreations of famous behind-the-scene photos. Yet the reality is... Um, and actually have a look here in the castle who played Michael Myers in the original Halloween is just rap filming uh, where he once again played Michael Myers. Stunt performer James Jude Courtney also cast to play Myers, likely tasked with donning the mask to do the film's actual stunt work, where the reality is Castle only appeared as Myers for one scene here. That's the only point where he's in the mask. And the, the person relegated to stunt double is in fact playing him the majority of the film and later interviews and articles do address this directly but initially when they were building up the promotion before the first film the presumption that castle primarily played the role can be found across various news articles and especially in fan discussion for uh, that sense of authenticity um i'm just gonna skip over another quote there to quickly uh get to actually what i was quite interested at the end um I have a little bit talking about sort of how this helps build the brand and IP, but we've sort of talked about that a little bit, so I'm not going to go over that too much. But um, nostalgia is both distancing, as I say, to when Halloween 2018 from the films that came before, while seeking to associate the film with the quality of the original 1978 movie, but never looking back. And um, so I wanted to conclude with just a little bit of fan reactions to Blumhouse. Um, all these comments are from one website, the comment section of the ever dependable bloody disgusting dot com. But I thought there's a whole range of opinions and thought that cover sort of a lot of what we talked today. Um, and these sort of highlight concerns that fans have. And whilst only one source, these comments I found replicated in other places I've been sort of researching for this. I quite like this. No one, I mean, absolutely no one, not even Uwe Boll, could do a worse job than Rob Zombie. So whatever comes out, we will win. Um, we've got a nice, uh, more positive look, saying you know, they think the zombie was mismatched. Some stuff worked, but they're feeling positive. This one I quite like. A real fan would take all eight films into consideration and make a real sequel, as we were saying earlier. Not some bullshit where we're going to ignore this because this was the only true one. Off with that. <laughs> Even Resurrection? Yes, of course. All you had to say was it's not a remake for some fans. Um, I'm not sure why so many are so quick to dismiss this idea. We know JC will work for a paycheck, but I think him back in the project is a great start, a bit compromised as a, as a comment that, you know, hedging the bets. But then we have the person who really, really feels passionate about it. Uh, I think it might be a gamble if Carpenter wasn't involved, but I think since he is, he'll make sure, and I can't read that because of at and the dude i feel what is iconic halloween and michael myers getting shit on you know just my opinion though because ultimately it is fans opinions but i think fan audiences and fan opinions are important and i think the marketing the companies believe that as well which is why there's this direct appeal to fan nostalgia and ideas um sorry i went a bit rushed at the end but uh thank you very much <laughs> mm. Great, thank you, Emma. Um, just letting everybody watching know that we won't have time to do a Q&A. So if you have any questions towards any of the panelists that we've had so far, be sure to like reach out over Twitter or social media or something like that. I'm sure they would be happy to answer. Okay, so our final paper panel 
is titled I've Waited for Him, Laurie Strode's Evolution from Final Girl to Neoliberal Militant in Halloween 2018. And that will be presented by Kara Lukansik. Kara is a doctoral student in Mass Communication and Media Arts Program Coordinator at the Center of Teaching Excellence at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Her research interests include film geography, film and television criticism, horror studies, and Eastern European national cinemas. She's published five scholarly book chapters and several academic book and film reviews. She is the assistant editor and film and television reviews editor of film criticism and sits on the advisory board for the Journal of Fantasy and Fan Cultures. Take it away, Kara. All right, so if you have any questions about this presentation, please feel free to email me at kara at siu.edu, which I have written here at the bottom of the screen. So just as a note, the work presented in this conference paper is an excerpt from a forthcoming book chapter of the same title, which will be published in the collection Gender and the Action Film Volume 2, edited by Steve Gerard and Renee Middlemost. So the horror genre provides a veritable playground for scholars interested in cultural studies and genre theory. Horror films are able to interrogate cultural norms and societal fears through the generic conventions and ideologies they continually replicate and challenge. Slasher movies are a subgenre of horror whereby a typically male masked monster torments teenagers, usually focusing his wrath and rage on a singular female victim. John Carpenter's Halloween, 1978, is often credited as inspiring the slasher cycle of the 1970s. The film is about a masked monster, Michael Myers, who kills teenagers, usually after they've had sex or committed some other transgression upon conservative society, such as drinking underage or doing drugs, and focuses his torments on 17-year-old Laurie Strode. The subsequent sequels in the franchise follow suit and feature victims, characters that transgress, and survivors, final girls who follow the rules of conservative 1970s culture, even well into the 1980s and beyond. David Gordon Green's 2018 installment of the Halloween franchise obviously comments on Me Too culture. Me Too being the feminist movement concerned with acknowledging and eliminating gendered sexual violence against women. Indeed, Halloween 2018 is largely considered one of the first Me Too movies and is certainly one of the first horror films to engage with the post Me Too world. Jamie Lee Curtis catalyzed this reading during the media tour for the film. In a San Diego Comic-Con panel, as well as with in interviews with Entertainment Weekly and Variety, she emphasized the film's position as a Me Too film, dealing allegorically with the gendered trauma brought on by the Harvey Weinstein scandal. If horror films allow us to grapple with cultural fears, on the surface it seems likely that they would interrogate the trauma of gendered sexual violence in the United States, driven by the Harvey Weinstein scandal and subsequent Me Too movement. Slasher films in particular are well positioned to comment on gendered violence as the slasher film has often been criticized as a reactionary subgenre that focuses upon male monsters who punish teenage girls for sexual misdeeds. As slasher films already center gender violence, they are a useful medium to interrogate the Me Too era. Within the context of Me Too, Halloween 2018 offers a different type of female protagonist than in the previous films. The heroine of the slasher film, or final girl, is the one who is, quote, chased, cornered, wounded, who we seem scream, stagger, fall, rise, and scream again. And that's from Clover. She is the victim, the one preyed upon. Indeed, the character of Laurie Strode has been, in the past, an embodiment of Carol J. Clover's final girl. She is often considered the quintessential final girl. This portrayal can be seen in Halloween, Halloween 2, Halloween H2O, and Halloween Resurrection. In each of these four movies, Laurie is the one who is victimized and hunted, preyed upon by a monstrous male psychopath, Michael Myers. In Halloween 2018, Laurie is once again the film's protagonist and would-be final girl. However, the audience doesn't see her, quote, chased, cornered, and wounded, end quote, in this film. Here we encounter an older Laurie Strode who lives with the gendered trauma of her younger self. She is no longer a victim. She's a survivor. Her survival comes with scars, physical and emotional. 
This essay seeks to explore Laurie Strode's transformation throughout the Halloween franchise. Once passive and victimized, Laurie, by Halloween 2018, has evolved. No longer the final girl or victim, her position and behavior in this film is much more in line with the neoliberal warrior woman of action films. Thus, the film assigns her the role of action heroine as a vehicle for responding to the concerns of the Me Too era. And in this era, women are no longer victims. Women can and will fight back. So this section from the book chapter is called Lori Strode as Warrior Woman, or the Sarah Connorization of Lori Strode. The first way that Halloween 2018 positions Laurie more in line with a warrior woman like Sarah Connor and less like the traditional final girls is through family estrangement. In the first Terminator film, the T-800 and Skynet wish to kill Sarah before she is able to give birth to the future leader of the resistance against Skynet. However, by Terminator 2, she has given birth to her son, John, but mother and son are separated. Sarah begins the film institutionalized in a mental hospital, while John lives with a foster family, thinking his mother is, quote, a total psycho. Very similarly, in Halloween 2018, Lori is estranged from her daughter, Karen, who was taken from her by social services when Karen was only 12 years old. After seeing the way that Lori was raising Karen, learning to shoot guns, build and set traps, and fight, social services deemed Lori an unfit mother and she was never able to regain custody. Therefore, Karen grew up estranged from her mother and believed that her mother was mentally unwell. To wit, she explains, quote, I have spent my entire life trying to get over the paranoia and neuroses that she has projected on me, end quote. Later in the film, the, the prison transport bus carrying Michael Myers crashes and Michael escapes. After hearing about the crash on the radio, Lori goes to alert Karen of the imminent danger. In the scene, Karen arrives home after shopping and she sets the bag of groceries on the table. She looks around nervously. She knows something is amiss. She calls out, is anyone home? But no one answers. Lori jumps out from the upstairs stairwell, forming a fake gun with her hands and shouts, gotcha. Lori's attempt to demonstrate the vulnerabilities and the security of her daughter's house is met with judgment. Instead of seeing Lori's motherly concern for her well being, Karen sees someone with unresolved issues in need of cognitive behavioral therapy. In both instances, Sarah with John and Lori with Karen, the mothers raise their children in a way that tries to prepare them for the future battles that each will face. In the Terminator franchise, Sarah knows that Skynet will not stop coming after them. The battles of Judgment Day are imminent. Likewise, in Halloween, Lori knows that Michael will return and attack her and her family. In both cases, mothers were separated from their children and their children grow up believing their mothers are crazy. The second way that Halloween 2018 aligns Lori with Sarah is by assuming neoliberal militant characteristics. A neoliberal culture transfers authority from official government sources to private experts, whereby individual assumes the sole responsibility for their well-being. In both instances, Sarah Connor in the Terminator franchise and Laurie Strode in the Halloween franchise, the protagonists have been failed by the police. In the case of Sarah, the police believe her to be crazy and delusional, therefore it cannot be any help to her. While with Laurie, the police do their best to protect her against Michael, but are unable to subdue the supernatural monstrous force that he embodies. Therefore, both women are forced to protect themselves. Early in both franchises, this self-protection was done through sheer defensive measures. The women begin as a waitress and a babysitter, so they have to think on their feet and find intelligent ways to outwit their attackers in order to survive their ordeals. In the case of Sarah, she makes defensive choices as she makes her way through the Cyberdyne Systems Factory in order to escape the T-800's attacks, while Lori similarly acts defensively against Michael. Her defensive moves are to hide and barricade herself away from her attacker, to use Michael's weapon against him, and to acquire intelligent makeshift weapons out of clothes hangers and knitting needles. However, by Terminator 2 and... Halloween 2018, the women warriors have fully transformed into neoliberal militants. Yvonne Tasker notes the hardness work required of women warriors in her book, Spectacular Bodies.
Thus, the bodies of both women are transformed from the first films in their respective franchises. After Sarah escapes from the mental hospital, we see her in her desert bunker. Her image is very masculinized. She is the tallest image in the frame. She towers over the picnic table to our right, the station wagon to our left, and the trees in the background. Her hair is tightly pulled back into a ponytail, which she later hides under a military cap. Her sunglasses, tank top, black jeans, and military belt pull her further and further away from the previous femininity as a waitress and towards the masculinization required of the warrior woman. Finally, she holds a cigarette in one hand and a shotgun in the other. The film simultaneously introduces a masculinized version of Sarah and shows us her underground bunker through a series of cuts. Sarah above ground, towering above and commanding over the natural world around her. John and the T-800 underground inside the heavily weaponized bunker. Sarah's desert arsenal gives off the feeling that she has spent years stocking it with weapons and ammunition. In Halloween 2018, Lori has a similar transformation. No longer the babysitter donning bell bottoms, she has transformed into a muscular, masculinized warrior. This is emphasized in an early scene in Lori's kitchen. Her hair is short, above shoulder length. She wears glasses. Her clothes support a more masculine gender presentation. She wears a green tank top, black jeans, leather belt with a hunting knife on her hip, and holds yet another knife in her hands. Like with Sarah, her image dominates and overtakes the frame. Her height over her surroundings confirms her authority. Her weapons are not found in a secluded desert bunker, but instead within her home, underneath her kitchen island. With the press of a button, the island slides to the side, revealing a set of stairs leading to her domesticated weapon center, cellar. Inside her bunker, she keeps various guns, knives, ammunition, and non-perishable food items. Elsewhere on her property, she has set up a shooting range. She has arranged white mannequins in the area that she uses for target practice. The mannequins are used and well-worn from being shot at, and Lori keeps spare man mannequins in her attic when her targets need replacing. Her mannequins are as alabaster white as Michael's mask. The third way that Halloween 2018 aligns Lori with Sarah is that both families are bonded and brought back together through an act of revenge. Both Terminator 2 and Halloween begin with children who think poorly of their mothers and end with mother and child reunited. In Terminator 2, Sarah protects John. She tries to keep him away from danger by going to Dyson's home in order to kill Miles before he is able to finish his microchip work, a precursor to the development of Skynet. In the climax, Sarah and John survive the attacks of the T-1000 and in the end, destroy both the T-1000 and T-800, so to ensure that no one can find a piece of either machine and get inspired to replicate the creation. The destruction of the T-1000 and to some degree, the T-800 brings Sarah and John back together and reunites them as a family unit. Likewise, in Halloween 2018, Lori tries to protect her daughter Karen and granddaughter Allison. She tries to bring Karen up in such a way that, quote, prepares her for the horrors of the world, end quote. In the film's climax, the three generations of women kill Michael together. In the scene, Michael, kill Michael, right? Um, in the scene, Michael tries to trip o tip over the kitchen island in order to attack Karen and Allison, hiding in the cellar underneath. Michael rips the island off its hinges and, and its track, and the island topples over. Karen shoots him with her, sh her childhood shotgun. Lori violently strikes Michael in the back of the head with a cast iron pan. Michael falls down the stairs and into the hidden basement cellar. As Karen and Allison run up the stairs away from Michael, Michael grabs Karen's ankle. Allison runs up the stairs and grabs Michael's butcher's knife from where he dropped it in the kitchen when Lori hit him with the frying pan. Allison stabs Michael with his own knife. He lets go of Karen's ankle, and the three women escape up the stairs. Lori pulls a lever, and bars cover the opening of the cellar. Michael is trapped inside. Lori then releases gas into every room of the house and drops a flare into the basement with Michael. The house ignites into flames. This joint attack upon Michael brings Lori, Karen, and Allison together. After the house catches fire, they run out to the road to seek help. A, a pickup truck stops and picks them up. 
the three women get into the bed of the truck. The last image of the film is the three women holding hands, their hands bloody, bonded, and Allison holding their weapon. The final section of my conference paper is titled Reimagining the Final Girl Within Me Too Culture. The comparison between Laurie Strode and Sarah Connor holds up until you consider the message. In Terminator 2, Sarah is brought to a point that she decides she cannot cross. That is, she does not sacrifice her humanity for her goals by not killing Dyson. In Halloween 2018, Laurie does not hold on to humanity. She, along with her daughter and granddaughter, hunt, trap, and kill Michael Myers. The film does not treat this action sympathetically. She is coded as monstrous. Indeed, this outcome is primed throughout the film. Journalists Aaron and Dana, as well as Michael's psychiatrist, Dr. Sartain, all suggest that villains and victims impact each other. Victimizing makes the villains more human, while being victimized makes the victims more monstrous. The question then becomes, what is this saying about Me Too culture? Is it supporting it? Does it say triumphantly that women can prevail against their attackers? Or is it vilifying the Me Too mo movement? Instead of celebrating the leap towards gender equality and accountability brought forth by Me Too, is the film condemning these women by suggesting that women who demand justice against their attackers are just as monstrous as the perpetrators? Recall the final image of Halloween 2018, as it is the most damning of all. The three women are rescued by a truck and they drive off, away from the house, in flames with Michael trapped inside. Their clasped hands covered in blood and holding the knife, thus solidifying the film's critique of neoliberalism in Me Too culture. That is, the first horror film to comment on Me Too culture villainizes its heroines, equating the film's equating the victims of sexual violence to the monsters who perpetrate such horrible acts is truly a horror indeed. Thank you so much. Fantastic, that was great, thank you. Okay, and that brings to close the fifth panel of the day.